I'm not the pacifist, I'm sorry. I fought four years against the Germans, not regretted one damn bit. So I can't stand here and say I condemn war as such. But I condemn the hurting of innocent and disabled people. This man is Bernard Fall. At 16, he was a guerrilla fighter with the Schmucky, twice wounded. At 20, he worked on the Nuremberg war crimes trials. At 26, he was with the French in Vietnam, researching firsthand for his PhD. At 40, he had written seven books and over 200 articles on Vietnam. He was an expert who lectured to military colleges, both before congressional committees, and published in three languages. A political science professor who loved the camaraderie of soldiers. A man whose instinct for the facts made him carry a tape recorder into combat. A humanitarian who studied war in search for peace. In this search, he died. On operations with the 9th Marine Regiment on the street without joy in South Vietnam on February 21st, 1967, Bernard Fall was killed by a VC landmine. He was my husband. Shortly before his death, he wrote this letter to me. On the envelope was written, Send only in case of serious accident to Mrs. Dorothy Fall. The letter reads, Darling, you will see this only if anything has happened. I want you to know that I loved you and the children terribly much and was proud of you. If I assumed the risks I did in this incredibly stupid and brutal war, I did so because somebody had to be a witness to what was happening. I hope that those poor blind men who direct America's policy will awaken to the real facts before it is too late. In that case, whatever happened to me will not have happened in vain. I know that you will be thinking of me as I will think of you no matter where I will be. Love, Bernard. My husband spoke and wrote fearlessly, regardless of opposition or threats of persecution, because he believed that it is more important than ever not to succumb to the temptation of the easy way out, no matter how difficult the trail of the truth or how heavy the burden of the record. February 1967. This is Bernard Fall in the street without joy, the old area where the French fought in 1953. We just walked across something like 12 kilometers of sand dunes. We were just normal march, a few shots one side, one, uh, at least one mine. But uh, so far, so good. <coughs> the voice in the background is out of a Vietnamese lieutenant who is talking to the uh, Vietnam Arvin First Division. We've got about uh, two companies of Marines and a small detachment of about ten Vietnamese regional and popular forces. So from a former communist guerrillas from this area. You know, they don't look like they're worth a damn. But uh, here they are. A Charlie company picked up two Viet Cong suspects, which within a few seconds were confirmed to be uh, Viet Cong supply carriers. A little girl, about 20, strapping girl, and uh, by the time the Vietnamese left us, they were already beating them. And of course, it's small wonder that no civilians stay behind except a few old women. 
But Charlie Company has fallen very badly behind, and now there's a big hole in our left flank. And uh, some people are running away from us. Obviously, it's beginning out of the way. We'll try and move across. We're going to start firing if they move. I'm going to fire fight. They got a mortar, don't they? Two mortars. Two mortars. That's the appeal now for the Viet Cong to surrender. It's impossible to run a meter to distinguish with it. There's no return fire or whatever. By tonight we'll know whether what we killed were Jane BC with weapons or simply people. Shadows are lengthening, and we've reached one of our phase lines after the firefight, and it smells bad, meaning a little bit suspicious. Could be now. The landmine which took Bernard's life has not stilled his voice. This film, from tapes of his lectures and interviews, is Bernard Fall's urgent warning to acknowledge the hard facts of this war and to face the choices which we as a democracy must make in Vietnam. I had an American officer out to Vietnam last summer said to me, you know, he says, this is, this is Vietnam for you. Ten years ago, we could have had a land reform with a piece of paper, just by getting the Vietnamese government to issue a decree on land reform and then do something about it. Five years ago, we could have bought the land. And now we got the paper with blood, acre by acre. Charge five, two four nine or eight, four four three. Them, they'll fight little little bands. These guys out here, they don't give up so easy. They're just like us. They stand in holy ground. So I just hope that they don't come. Power! Two shots comes on two.
I just lay there next to him and hope that we both make it past this rocket, that it hits out there somewhere. Been lucky so far. designed to break the enemy's will to resist. That's the definition of war. In the old uh, truism that the purpose of war is to break the enemy's will to resist is still true in revolutionary warfare. Basically, the war can be won. Basically, the war is being fought not for Vietnam, but simply purely to prove that revolutionary war doesn't work and that uh, uh, armed containment does work. I'm only afraid it doesn't prove anything. Uh, wars don't deter each other. The fact that the Germans got fathered in World War I didn't stop them from fighting World War II, practically in the same conditions. People don't work that way, otherwise war would have gone out of existence 5,000 years ago. I'm very much afraid that as the situation goes on and degenerates, as everything is lost sight of except the brutal fact of winning, that we are simply preparing ourselves to four or five other counterinsurgency operations of a similar type. Okay, can you wrap it around him? Wrap it around him. Okay. This is, in my view, where most of the mistakes are being made as we look at the Viet Cong, as we look at the uh, at any of these revolutionary warfare situations. Because we look at the military aspects of it, whereas the military aspects are simply as they should be in any war, the means of achieving a political aim. This is an operation which, in spite of all the crisis of the phrase, is fought for the hearts and minds of people. But finding really counts, and counts decisively, is whether the population believes that the government for which they are supposed to fight is going to outperform the competitive guerrilla. Force is inevitable in the sense that you have to protect what you're promising. But this is a very, very narrow vicious circle if you want to. You can only hold the population if the population tells you where the infiltrators are, where the communist guerrillas are. They will only tell you if they have confidence in you that you're going to deliver the good. The hard fact is that Vietnam has been left for 10 years with all its very real social economic problems unattended to. That is what makes for insurgency. <laughs> Basically, the only time somebody thinks of economic reform is when the communists draw our attention to it. If you've got 2% of the landlords owning 45% of the land, you've got yourself a problem even if you don't have the VC. Now we've got the real credibility gap between the Vietnamese population and its own government. <laughs>
There is a very big gap between the people and the government, the actual government now. In other words, the government doesn't present anybody. I don't think the Vietnamese people, any Vietnamese people accept the war, except a very a handful of people who are making benefit of this war, of this war. What's happening to the people in the countryside? They, uh, in, in people in the country, what they get, they get, what they get is death, is starving, what they get is all the unhappiness in the world. They are very disappointed. And they didn't know, even then, they didn't know why the war. And they played violent. They want uh, to, they want the peace to preserve uh, the land, for the peace to raise chicken and to make some crops, something like this. Do they blame the Americans for the war? Who should they blame? The no, no, it's not American. Because, you see, it is, uh, there is one delicate thing that foreign, uh, foreign troops uh, in this country should be put into consideration. You see, we, most Vietnamese people, whenever they see foreign troops here, they see war. So, to them, the war must be brought here by foreign troops. This is very simple, this is very you know, logical. Just period, leave us alone. Leave us My name is Jerry Lyle. I'm ashamed, I'm ashamed to be in America. For 16 months I've been justifying American policy in Vietnam. And I don't, I, I, I've run out of, of justification for it. We're alienating the people, we're destroying the country. And we're doing these things in, in the names of peace and democracy. These are the people I've been working with for a year and a half. Refugees and peasants. They don't understand a great deal that's happening in their country. For them, the war is a very personal thing. That on one side, the great American power directed seemingly at them personally. And the fact that their brothers and their sons and their fathers and their sisters are fighting those Americans. Shanlan Village. These people are refugees from the Khoisan Valley, about six kilometers to the north of here. These people have moved in here made the decision themselves to leave the country which was a free strike zone to live close to the American camp the Marine Battalion here not only for security reasons but to get food having left their old lands and being unable to, to farm the Hamlet chief says that the, that the army doesn't trust the people that he doesn't trust them, doesn't understand them, that he can't tell the difference between between the VC and the people that are on the side of the government. The Hamlet chief says that for the last seven months the people in this Hamlet have bought their security from the VC by giving them rice, medicine, and some money to keep the VC from using their hammer as a as a haven to to fire on the on the on the American battalion. There are a great many VC in the area. Probably uh, three battalions of VC. But now at least one regiment of North Vietnamese regulars. He says that on the 1st of November, about six VC snipers moved in and shot at the battalion. The next afternoon, the army came in and burned all of the houses in his hamlet. 
He says, after the army burned his houses, 6 BC came in and they offered to take the people back into the VC controlled country to protect them from the Americans. And the VC abducted one boy from the village and then left. of the Vietnamese population. Without him, you can't carry on a policy, not in the long run, you It has been said that the United States, as a way of life, did not stand up for what is called freedom in Vietnam, but other countries might lose heart. To which one may only answer respectfully that there are millions of Vietnamese peasants who look at the shambles of their own surroundings and probably feel that this kind of freedom is being bought pretty dearly and being bought at their expense. We've got an 82 millimeter mortar tube up here. We're going to send it in to you. We're checking out the rest of the area. We've got one dead goop up on the top of the hill. He'll probably back in just a minute. Let's go take a look. Yeah, I got to go see him. Man, he don't hit that. Oh, I need some ammo, man. Not right here, they help. Hold on. Get some ammo in here. Hey, Timbro. Is this your man? You're fast, Colorado? You know what, everybody? Bunker. Okay, get the civilians out in one spot and go in the bunker. Get you out of there, huh? You kept a damn old man home right there. Yeah. Yeah, that's a shame. Half the civilians helped the NBA and the VC. The other half don't. Don't. They gotta treat them all the time. Make sure there's nobody in it, sir. Make sure you're not in it. Hey, Davenport, have you got a little bit of that tall, skinny guy with a funny-looking face? Yeah, Robert? Yeah. <laughs> He's got worms. Bring him around the back there and leave him. Let's go, move that second squad on through. Right. 
Watch it, Max. Watch your shit. You find out what's wrong with the kids? Have they mentioned that? Oh, they're afraid that uh, well, well, the trouble will bring them up to this thing. The little kids will die because of this day. That's where they have to do Helicopter, when they take them up, they'll kill the kids. What was the difference? Thank God it was a few people that were just a drunk. His wife and children went to join the NBA. Nobody ever returned, no, he never returned, and his face just burned and burned. He was shot by me because he was snapping from a tree that the fire got in the end. Hey, uh, I'll give thanks to God in prayer. We thank Thee for life. We thank Thee for the commanding light that shines out of darkness. For laying the foundation of the earth. We thank Thee for creating us in Thine image by giving us an intelligence initiative and responsibility that we have, and for keeping us in thy steadfast love. Let's stand and sing. We always sound a little better when we do. On a hill far away, to the old of his love, the end of us all sing and change. And I love that old call. You know, in the humanity, they are men, I am men, we are the king. We have no reason to hate them. But because of all the uh, destruction they made in Vietnam, so I hate them. The war they made is destroying, it's destroying our, our people, our country. How you know the B-52 airplanes, all the modern, all the weapons, they destroyed. Uh, my village is now completely destroyed by the B-52 bomb. All my people, about 15 families left. Because, uh, 
the other on the side. I'm funny now, and I will get back at 23. And the same, as it, is, it will, will happen the same as to my friends. Hold a weapon, go out in the field of battle and fight and make it die. And my future is just a tomb. Many other people, many other young people, same age, same my age. So they do not like to get big, to be plastic. Because who will they fight for? I do not trust my government. Because they are just a puppet, American puppet. What do I show to begin the American with the destruction and the, and the communist? Twenty years before, my father was killed by the communist. So, but I won't choose a communist. Because under communist, you can leave at least. You know, the Vietnamese people are quiet people. They do not like the war. And they spend most of their time to work on the pet and the petty and rice petty. They do not have interest about the politics, so they just want to spend a quiet life, working in daytime and relax night time with, um, with their family. You know, because men, they, they are born to live. The rain on the leaves is like a marvelous tears running down the face. The rain on the leaves is like a baby crying for his father to come home. It reminds the truth that your loved one will never return, and it makes you love for the last time. The rain on the leaves shows the sorrow of the war. Everything else is 
do the population for you or against you. This is really basically what it comes down to again. We just don't know. But whether we can, in the midst of this kind of war, uh, hope that the Vietnamese will finally be convinced on the basis of democratic performance that our side is better, is pretty doubtful. I like it out there, Soldier. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I've been walking since early this morning, walking the last couple of days, pretty steady with full pack on, and been burning a lot of bleaches and stuff. Man, it's just rough. It's something. Who's who's off? I really don't think too much of this war. Really, I think that uh, we're not fighting it as much as we should be, really, I think we ought to go all out and win this war, and most of us want to get it over with and get home. To win the war militarily, the total figure of 2.5 million men is not excluded on state military terms. Everybody laughed when Hanson Baldwin said that it would take a million Americans to get them. I think a lot of people aren't laughing no more. This is precisely the whole tragedy that it takes an enormous amount of troops, or it takes the population support. And the population won't support you until it's been shown that you win. You can't win without the population. It goes beautifully in circles. Obviously, there's one last alternative to all this. Massive firepower. Massive firepower will do an awful lot. There's no point trying to perceive massive firepower intellectual. You've got to see it. Against that, your ideology, your motivation, and it becomes largely irrelevant at a certain point. Don't you ever forget it. That kind of firepower kills an awful lot of people. So against that, of course, you don't have to have counterinsurgency. Or you don't have to have insurgency. You simply and purely eliminate the problem militarily. And then you reconstruct the vessel of Vietnam. Now this is, now kid yourself, this is the solution. The point then is, of course, what does it prove? Because it is being said that basically what's at stake in Vietnam is the credibility of the West to be able to contain a liberation war. All I can say for this is the typical military approach to a non-military problem is politically sterile. I would say in short range terms, it is in the Machiavellian, the most Machiavellian interest of the United States to deal at one level or another, directly with the D.C. Uh, simply and purely for the very good reason that the D.C. are the people who are most exposed and therefore most subject to pressure. The fact is, the Viet Cong has shown in the past some very clear differences of view with Hanoi and obviously Peking. The question now arises, well, who is really fighting this war on the D.C. side? The North Vietnamese troops inside South Vietnam represent at the very most 12% to 15% of the total combat force. We are fighting until further notice an awful lot of South Vietnamese. There must be an awful lot of VC who are worried that they're going to get frozen out of the whole thing, that the United States is going to make some deal with the North, and the VC are going to stay there and get slaughtered. After all, the communists and Southeastern were sold out before, in 1954. I personally feel that not enough has yet been done to divide the opposition in Vietnam. This is not solution, these are approaches. But there aren't any good solutions. Good solutions are gone. But the military solution, now can the United States win military? Of course. The United States can win militarily in Vietnam, in which case we'll take a million men, and probably four or five years of severe military operations, probably 30, 40, 50 billion dollars. So the judgment then has to be made, 
whether a measly two-bit war in the middle of nowhere is worth one million bits. I feel that we must now realize that there have to be some political uh, solutions and visits. This includes negotiating with the U.S. Congress. This is then a matter of political judgment, which is of course the proper in a military situation, particularly in the United States and democracy. But the political judgment will have to be, and will have to be soon, because we may not have any Vietnamese to support. But there aren't any good solutions. Good solutions are gone. Looking at the war, there was a line of passages that always came back to me. They've made this a desolation, and they called it peace. 